I am Naya Masta, and I am an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Southern California. I study lemur diet and feeding ecology, and to some extent feeding behavior. This is Happily Lemur Sinus. This is a nice picture taken by Chia Tan. Happily Lemur Sinus is one of the most endangered primates on the planet. We really don't have good current estimates of its population. People have made some really very, very approximate guesses. Estimates have ranged from less than 100 individuals, which is frightening. <laughs> that's true because that's, that's almost extinct to several thousand. But really, it's because it's so hard to find these animals that we don't really have a really good sense of how many there are. But within the area that we work in, which is called the Talatakeli site of Juan Mafan, um, Chia started following it in 96, I believe. I think at, at the beginning, the group total was over 10 individuals, and now it's shrunk to about five individuals with no reproductive males, until one showed up recently. So it's a population that's very much on the decline within Tlaltecali, which is not to say that that's unnatural. It could be that it naturally ebbs and flows and increases and decreases. One of the females has gotten pregnant. There was a lone male that came into the group and impregnated the female and she had a baby. I believe it was in December of 06. So it's, it's almost a year old now. And that was a very good thing to see. What's really interesting, though, is that before she had habituated them, no one saw happening with sinus. People knew that it was there. You'd have occasional sightings of it. In the many years that I worked there before she came in, from 1990 to 1994, I think I saw maybe one. I had one sighting of happening with sinus, and that was it. But after she had habituated them, they had no fear of humans anymore. They just didn't pay any attention to you, really. So now literally busloads of tourists will show up, and we'll go and look at these animals and they would just sit there patiently eating their calm and really just ignoring everybody else. And they become major tourist attractions. <laughs> you know, the bamboo lemurs are called the gentle lemurs. I don't know why, because I don't see them as particularly gentle or violent compared to any other lemurs. But I think it's because they kind of, they're very quiet and they kind of do their own thing. And they're not jumping around the forest like some of the other animals, so you don't hear them. These next few pictures are just from video stills, and they just show how the happily Simons strip this bamboo call. What they do, they'll start a little strip with their canines to just kind of gouge a little hole in it, and then they'll just strip it down, which is what they're doing in these next few pictures. They're stripping it down all the way to what's called the internode of the bamboo column. You know, the, the trunk of the bamboo is called a column. It has those little horizontal bits called internodes. So once they get to that internode, they have to cut them off. And that actually requires some work, I think, for them, because they have to just kind of rough it with their, with their teeth. And obviously, they're anchoring themselves. You can see from the placement of the hands that really they have to kind of anchor themselves like this in order to really gouge it out. So since I'm interested in the mechanical properties of the foods, you know, I have to see how they're actually processing this stuff. I think they're peeling it down, so I have to test it. So I test peel toughness. I test the cutting toughness across the horizontal fibers, which is important. And then they do something really interesting. I don't think you can see it in these pictures. They take that outer sheath, and they peel it off, actually. They don't eat that part. And they're just eating that little woody part in between. And of course, you know, when, when we think of bamboo, we think of it as wood, because when we see it, it's very dry. When it's fresh, it's still quite woody, but it's kind of a very porous, light wood. And it's pretty juicy, actually. It has a lot of juice in there. What they do is they um, will bite off pieces of it, will swallow it up just cold like that. And when you look at their feces, what goes in is pretty much exactly what comes out. You look at it and go, what are they getting from that? Because it doesn't look like they're processing it in any way. And we think it's something like chewing sugarcane. So they're taking something that's like sugarcane and just kind of sucking on it. And then they're just voiding the rest of it. This is the giant bamboo, and it contains cyanide. There are many bamboo species in Madagascar, actually. But not all of them have the same amounts of cyanide. This is the one that's, of the ones we tested, this is the one that has the highest amounts. We really don't know how they're able to tolerate or neutralize that cyanide at this point. But it would be an interesting, certainly an interesting avenue of future research. These are just to show you the great seasonal variation at Beza, which is a very seasonal dry forest. This is just the, the same location in two different seasons. It's kind of like Southern California, actually, in, in the amount of rainfall it gets. It gets all its rainfall between basically November to March or April, and then there's not a drop of rain, usually, that falls between the other months. And then the rainfall starts up again in late October, November or so. And this is a group picture of the three principal investigators on our last 
field season. So this is taken in front of the Sancho del Bio, which is just outside the park. So the park is behind us. There's me on the left, and Chia Tan in the middle, and Chris Vineyard on the right. Chia Tan is now at the Center for Conservation and Research for Endangered Species, or CRAS, at the San Diego Zoo. Chia started out as a primatologist who was just studying the happily lived animals. She was the one that first habituated and studied all three of the species that co-occur in Tawatakele. And she did this phenomenal amount of field work just following those animals and getting data on the socioecology of those animals. She's doing a lot of work in Asia now and has slightly moved her focus away from Madagascar further east. Chris Vineyard is at the Department of Anatomy at neo UConn. neo UConn stands for Northeastern Ohio University's College of Medicine. It's, it's actually a consortium of many different universities in Northeast Ohio, and it's their medical school, basically. And he actually didn't start out as someone who did a lot of field work at all. He did mostly laboratory work, since he's interested in the jaws and muscles of the oral apparatus. But what was interesting for our project is that we each brought our own specialization to it. Gia brought all this knowledge of socioecology. I was looking at the plant properties, and Chris was looking at the jaw mechanics. This is Dr. Kathy Williams, who is a veterinarian from the Duke New York Center. And she was one of our collaborators on our project. She was helping to ensure that the animals, when we darted them, were healthy. She was checking the respiration, the heart rate, the amount of oxygen that they were taking in. And for our purposes, we were doing some semi-invasive things to the animals, and she was just making sure that they were coping well with the procedures. And in, in all cases, she found that they were fine. This is Happily Aureus. It is the golden, gentle bamboo lemur. Pacolima aureus was discovered in 1987 in Ramapa National Park by Patricia Wright and colleagues, including Bernard Meyer and Yves Montclair. Patricia Wright actually went to Madagascar to look for another species called Pacolima sinus, which had not been seen or reported on in, in the past few decades. And ironically, this is actually one of the easier species to see nowadays. It's, it's actually quite abundant in the forest, and it's you know, some of a mystery that it eluded discovery for so long, but of course the local people knew about it. Just a pretty picture of the, of the site in Ranamathan. This is just above a hill looking toward Tawatakele. Tawatakele is really the main research area in Ranamathan. There are several other ones, but Tawatakele is the one that's closest to the research station, and it's the one that has the easiest access, and it does have a lot of animals there. So it just looks like this beautiful, pristine forest, and then you can see these little bare patches off in the distance where there has been slash and burn agriculture. This is the same area, more or less, but as we often see it, it's shrouded in mist and in vapor <laughs> because it rains a lot. It's a rainforest, and it rains a lot. I think this was taken paradoxically during what we call the dry season. <laughs> and I say dry season in quotation marks because it rains a lot in the dry season. But what happens is that when you compare the wet season amounts versus the dry season amounts, the wet season has absolutely no rain but it falls torrentially, so it, it's almost like clockwork. It rains at certain times of the day, and then it's dry for the rest of the day, and very sunny. And, you know, things dry out during those intervals. In the dry season, it just rains continuously. So it's steady drizzle all the time. Nothing ever dries. Everything gets completely moldy. And it's also the cool season, so when it's cool and it's wet, it feels even colder than it actually is. The rainforest is really beautiful when it's raining. So, it's pleasant on that, in that respect, but it's not so pleasant when you have new shows, so you have to pick off all the time when it rains. And so <laughs> it can be sort of challenging to work in the dry season of the rainforest. I also study lemur cattle, also looking at the um, diet of these animals. These are dry forest animals. They occur at Bessemaha Valley and really all over the south and southwest of Madagascar. And they're one of the more widespread animals and one of the ones that are more populous. So this is, I believe that's a female, that would only make sense. And this is an infant. I don't think that's even a yearling yet. They're just taking a nap together and it's on its mother's back. Between the time when they are starting to be weaned away from the mother's breast and before they're really fully independent, they'll ride around on their mother's back like jockeys. It's really quite cute. And they'll sleep like that too. So that's another one child. The lemur cat is fascinating to watch. They're hell to take data on because they're always running around. So when you're doing focal animal follows, where you're just looking at one individual and trying to follow it, when it's moving around all the time, it's really difficult to take data on it. But, um, you know, they're just a lot of fun to watch. 
you see something that is also kind of interesting about lemur cat is that they're highly terrestrial compared to other lemurs. They spend a lot of time on the ground. So they use our paths actually to, to walk around on. You see their characteristic tails waving off in the distance as they walk. When, when you're a lemur cat, you walk with your tail straight up. What's interesting though is that during part of their mating rituals, which take place in March, April, they will have what are called stink fights. The males will have stink fights. And they have these huge glands on their wrists called wrist glands or antibraco glands. And they will take their tail and go <laughs> on their tail with these glands <laughs> so that they're nice and pungent. And then they'll start waving at each other. Because the stress lines and numerous stress lines have what are called the wet noses, they have what we would call a hair lip. So you know, they have this kind of thing going like that where their upper lip and their nose are connected. And what's happening there is that they have a little organ on the bottom of the palate called the Jacobson's organ or the varmonasal organ. The VNO is very good at sensing pheromones and they are able to pick up on all these scents. They have a behavioral response to these scents. The males will start squaring off, literally squaring off, face to face like that, start waving these things at each other and they'll kind of lunge and lunge and lunge. And they get quite violent some of these fights. You know, at the end of the season you'll see males with missing ears ripped ears, missing eyes in some cases, and they really rub themselves up. And it's really all to, you know, to get the female. And as you can see, they like to sleep in trees. And this is actually one of their favorite feeding trees as well. This is the tamarind, or the tamarindus indica, or the keeling tree, as it's called natively. Like I said, they're really cute to watch, you know, because they do all these kind of, you know, things that are kind of adorable, and then things that are just, like, fascinating. This is going out to Beza, which is really out in the middle of nowhere, which is one of the reasons why there's still forests there. You know, as, as it happens in a lot of parts of the world where you see tropical forests of any kind remaining, it's because it's very difficult to get to. In this case, this is very remote, and the roads are very bad going into it. In the rainy season, it becomes like mud. We still try to go out there with four-wheel drive vehicles, mm -hmm. but they usually get stuck. So the local way of moving around is via these oxen carts called charrettes. You're sitting out on, on the back of this, bouncing around this very dusty, broken road. Bethel is only about 33 kilometers from the nearest village. When you get the charrette, it takes over eight hours. You can walk faster. But if you have a lot of luggage, you can't really do that. Um, so you put it on the back of this oxen cart, and away you go. Every season, you have to do one or two of these if you have to get into town. I think at the time that I did this, there wasn't a vehicle waiting for me. Sometimes you can arrange a vehicle ahead of time. And I think I arrived either a day early or a day late, I can't remember which, and there was no vehicle. So <laughs> you do what you have to do, you just get the local charrette and away we went. This is a luppy lemur. Luppy lemurs are sometimes called the sportive lemurs, and they're actually quite small as well. What's kind of an interesting thing about them is that they are one of the smaller folivores in the primate group. Folivores are animals that are eating predominantly leaf material, and it's usually the case that folivores are fairly large animals because in order to get sufficient nutrients from leaves, which are kind of nutrient poor, you have to eat a lot of them. So there's a lot of bulk processing involved. When you think of you know, leaf eaters or grass eaters, like cows or horses or something like that, these are big animals. And then you have this animal that's a weapon eater that's able to subsist on a diet of leaves, which is interesting. These are nocturnal animals. All the other animals I've talked about, the papal lemurs and lemur cata, are for the most part diurnal. This picture was taken during the day. <laughs> and what they usually do is they, they secrete themselves into these kind of little nests within the nooks of these trees. And for whatever reason, this animal was just in an area <laughs> where it was easily visible. Their eyes are kind of orangey-yellow. In fact, a lot of the lemurs have kind of yellow-orange eyes. With, the, with, the, with a few exceptions, you have some animals have brown eyes, and you have some that have bright blue eyes. So, <laughs> again, huge variation there. But this monkey was so funny because it was just posing right there. And it was pretty high up, and you had to know where to look for it. And someone, of course, pointed out to me because I don't think I would have seen it. But then it, it stayed there for you know, several days and probably several weeks even. I mean, of course, it would venture out at night, come back, and go to sleep, but it's in the same place. This is the main river that flows to the north of Tawatakele in Ranamakong. This is the Namurana River. The river and the road, which is just above it actually, is a dividing point between what are called different parcels of the park. And the parcel that's on the other side from where we are doing the research is considered more of a buffer zone. So a buffer between the park and the villages that are outlined. This is the white shatak or the rose shatak. 
this is a dry forest animal, so this is one of the species that Bezomaha folly. This also occurs throughout the southern part of Madagascar and also in the western part of Madagascar. So this is actually a pretty widespread species. Um, there are rainforest counterparts to this animal as well, which I've studied very briefly in Ramaphan, and there are people like Patricia Wright that study it continuously. I mean, shafox are just very fun animals to watch because of the way they leap. And here's an animal taking off. What you can see happening here is that they almost always take off backwards like that for obvious reasons, because you want to take off in, in the direction which is closest to whatever it is that you're going to be approaching. And they will frequently go from vertical support to vertical support, so from trunk to trunk. They can also go from horizontal support to horizontal support, of course. They have very long legs and relatively long arms as well, and really, really big hands for really good grasping. What's interesting here is that the support that it's going toward is off the screen, and it's probably a good three or four meters across, which is, for us, would be a huge leap. For them, it's nothing. When you watch them doing this, it's, just, it's like a day at the beach. I want to just, you know, jump. He, he or she, I can't really tell here, is pushing off with his feet, and it's going to kind of twist in the air and land on his support. But so fox themselves are not that much bigger than a lemur cat. You would see this animal and you compare the macata to anything. This must be a much larger animal because its arms and legs are so long. But it's it's about two and a half kilos, a little bit more than two and a half kilos. That's not a large animal. But they're phenomenal leapers. I mean they're really engineered for that. Now they're beautiful to watch when they go from support to support to support to support. It's very hard to follow them, but um, they can go for very they can travel long distances very quickly. This is a beza again. This is also a white schlock, or Propithecus broxy broxy. This is one of the, the best pictures I think I've ever taken. <laughs> and I, I actually had to borrow someone's lens for this and went out taking photos of these animals. And this is an animal that just happened to be in the right position at the right time for me. And this was in the dry season. You can tell just by looking at the tree that there's very little foliage on it. And this is also another picture of a schlock. And you can just see it hanging vertically on a tree. It's just kind of resting. He's actually hanging very low, so he's just like a meter and a half up, maybe. Yeah, so a lot of the Shafox and a lot of the Mercata now at this site have identifying collars and pendants on them. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to do any sort of focal animal follow on them because they all look very much alike. They're very hard to individualize, actually. You can do it, but it's really not easy. It's important to do the focal animal follows because you want to be able to follow individuals instead of just you know, whoever you can see because then you don't know if you're mixing up the sexes, if you're date getting data that can be even compared. If you follow individuals without knowing who they are, you're not getting a complete record of the day of that animal. And in some cases, it's very easy to try to follow animals and do something interesting. So if you're interested in the feeding as I am, but at the same time you want to put it in the context of their overall activities, you know, for me, I would just be drawn to the ones that are feeding, 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 and then you would look at the data and be very skewed for feeding when really it's really happening is that in the individual, then that entire feeding record is only feeding for a fraction of the time. Because again, it's all context. It's all putting it into a context for the behavioral records. Um, I thought I would just throw in a picture of the capital. This is Tana, or Antanamaribo. And this is a view from the zoo, actually. So this is kind of what it looks like. It's, it's built on hills. It kind of looks a lot like Southern California to some extent. You kind of look off in the distance and there are all these kind of houses and trees on the hills. This is pretty, pretty typical of town.